Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to hear about The Great Cosmic Mother of All by Monica Sue and Barbara Moore, discussed by Jill Raymond and Batcher Weinbaum. Uh, so thanks very much and over to you, Jill and Batcher. Uh, hi everyone. I'm just going to start by reading the part of uh, the introduction and then I'm going to hand over to Batia who's going to talk about part one. Um, this is a personal introduction and it's uh, from Monica. For a woman now to be able to recognize and love the goddess, she must also be able to love herself and the goddess in other women. Women's ancient love for each other has been diverted and has been forcibly directed exclusively towards the male as representing the Godhead. Feminine, feminism means the rebirth of the goddess in us. She is the one universal and infinite self. Since what we are all taught is human history turns out to be only male constructs, since we found that all institutionalized religions, philosophical, economic, cultural, etc., teachings in this society are completely male separatist and male supremacist and are based on the assumption that the females derive from the male as reflected in the very language, I feel totally free to look at herstory from a completely feminist point of view. There's an explanation concerning her method, their methods. It is written to those who want to see hard objective facts and historically documented evidence written from an academic point of view. This is how our society works. Privileged men have the money, the time and encouragement to spend years doing academic research, wearing out their trousers, sitting in libraries, sharing the esoteric in language, collecting information from manuscripts locked away on dusty shelves only for use of the for the specialists and written in a language impossible to understand for anyone who hasn't already spent years doing these studies. According to all this, I, a self-taught woman without this specialized training, should have no right to even think of attempting to write a book dealing with ideas about cosmos, religion, ancient myth, human culture. And where should I have got the time, money, energy to do these academic studies, even if I'd wanted to, when at the age of 22, I had two small children and lived on the breadline. Clearly, I had no academic right to write this book, but I take this right. Okay, that's Batia. my okay. That is going to uh, uh, talk about the first um, section. Yeah. Of the book. First, I want to talk a little bit about the book. Um, Monica and Barbara, the co authors, met at um, Women's Spirit Rising, a woman's land in Oregon that published a women's spirit journal in 1976 when they first started collaborating. But since then, the book has gone through many, many, many publications in many languages in many countries. And I'm talking on the version that is available to listen to as an audiobook for free if you google or do a search on great cosmic mother monica stu and barbara moore audiobook free you can listen to it yourself and i just listened to it for about a week solid in my cabin in the mountains and it was very mind-blowing and i feel like i have a personally increased radical feminist consciousness from listening to this non-stop for a week um and basically the book is discussing the ancient religion of the great cosmic mother. And I did have a, uh, an experience of trying to teach this book in a, um, in a women's studies, women and gender studies capstone seminar. And when I was proposing the syllabus, the uh, chair kept saying, you know, I needed to use scholarship. I needed to use scholarship. And I have to tell you that this book in itself, um, I mean, originally there, there are extensive photographs with photo credits. You can see original art from the Paleolithic and Neolithic ages. 
Um, it's the best book to read if you want to get the images all collected in one place from, from archaeology. Um, I've also taught Eisler's book, Chalice and the Blade, but she couldn't get her publisher to pay for any photographs. So this is a plus on this book. And so uh, Monica started off writing uh, pamphlets on women in art as long ago as 1974, but the book kept getting produced until 1987. Um, and there's a wonderful author and subject index. It's built on writers of the 19th century like Morgan and Bakovin and Riffal, many of the radical feminist theorists of the 70s like Kate Millen and sexual politics also use those theorists. She draws on Jane Ellen Harrison. She, she draws on Helen Diner, on Newman, on Joseph Campbell. And she also draws on underground publications of the time like Afra and Off Our Backs. And importantly as well, manuscripts circulating in Xerox form that had never been published yet. So it's a very exciting book. Um, church history is included about the Inquisition intermixed with writers like Foucault and writers of the feminist movement like from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s like Robin Morgan and Carolyn Merchant and Janice Raymond and Jill Johnson and Susan Brown Miller and T. Grace Atkinson and Jean Marcolet. So they, there's Andrea Dworkin, Judy Grant, the Shulmuth Firestone. I mean, it's it's like old home week with all the radical feminist writers that are mentioned. And, um, and many university presses were drawn from, many mainstream presses. And um, basically the idea is, um, that there were matriarchal religious aspects that existed that we don't have any direct means to access the knowledge, but we do have these visual representations that we can try on and use and reimmerse our psyches and the consciousness of. And that's what uh, Monica did as an artist. And you can't help but do that yourself when you look at the book. Um, so I encourage you all to do so. We don't have the people anymore to talk to, but we do have these primal images, which she's collected. and. Um, the book is organized into four parts. And in the beginning, we talk about Marx and matriarchy and then the original black mother. And um, the premise is that we were all created female over 2 billion years ago. And we were all female ruled by the moon. And the, there was a marine life reproducing parthenogenetically over the whole planet, one massive body with no specific sex organs. But then this massive body had to get minimized uh, as a sea environment in the course of evolution in the body of, of women. And the lunar rhythms are, are entered the women's body is what's talked about in part one. And the penis um, appear, didn't appear until the age of reptiles and males were actually created by females to perform a certain function for them. And once males were only produced like annually, like drones or like in a hive to fertilize the queen and then killed by sterile female workers. So this is how we all began. We all began as female. And the book also argues that parthenogenesis is possible in humans still, like in cloning, but sexual reproduction is necessary for more complex evolution. And that's how um, evolution began. And even though females have been around longer, um, femaleness then got eclipsed in the course of evolution. Um, they argue that men discovered this, the origin of the world is female, but they didn't want it to be known. A Darwin, however, was behind theory that the first six weeks, the embryo is bisexual and only develops as male or female after the clit or the penis, originally the same organ, is formed by the same tissue. But in the presence of androgen, um, the complex folds and layers of the labia are formed. And the penile is a, is a simpler technology. And males originally protected by and as the female um, surrounded them, but then they had to develop masculine hormones to protect themselves later. And um, then we see what happens with those hormones over time. They had to protect themselves against the chemical warfare of female hormones attacking them within the womb. Um, so this is a devi the, the maleness is a deviation from the primary female pattern. And this information was buried by male scientists and the female was seen as a passive vehicle only. And this was the reverse of reality and evolution. And these findings were not developed or integrated into psychoanalytic theory or scientific theories. And um, that's why these early images are so important is to, is to spark in our imaginations the reality of, of, uh, 
of what happened in evolution uh, so that we can get some sense of ourselves as the actual creators. Um, but the, the book goes on through psychology and philosophy, through much genetics, through folklorists like Stith Thompson, mythologists like Robert Graves. Um, they explore the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, um, sociologists and economists like Veblen, and they discuss sex, sexology and Desaad and Hindus and Celts and African civilization and Nazis and just a, a whole range of um, paganism and body and mind splits and, and language and television and secular humanism and colonialism and right up through the bra burning and radical feminist days. And the, the sources are, are really incredible. As, as a scholar, I've really enjoyed revisiting this book and seeing how much university press scholarship was used. And, and, um, and uh, as well as small presses like West End Press and Press Gang and, it was a, and Women's Press. So it was a way to validate the radical feminist thinking that was coming up at the time and fold it into the existing scholarship. Um, and also um, the footnotes are impressive in themselves. If you, if you get to listen to the recorded version, you can just listen to all the footnotes at the end. And uh, the footnotes include critiques of some of their own sources and go through Reagan's presidential budget cuts. And um, uh, she, they're basically proposing an ancient civilization that traveled and carried a women's matriarchal culture worldwide. And matriarchy here is not the opposite of patriarchy where men dominated and oppressed. And the argument for why matriarchy doesn't just oppress men is that women gave birth to men. So why would they want to oppress their own offspring? Which is a pretty good argument. Um, the arguments made that women invented civilization and did it so well that there was accumulated surplus in agriculture with 75 to 85% of survival food provided by the women which displaced the hunters. And so the men didn't have anything to do because so many of the survival needs were taken care of by women. So the men were running around without anything to do. So they decided to create armies. And, and really the argument is made is that armies and warfare were the only thing that men actually created. So the book inspired many, but was also inspired um, by many writers of the time. And the four parts, as I think we said, were women's early culture beginnings, um, we're talking about Marx and matriarchy and original communism being in the ancient women oriented groupings, which Mark and, Marx and Engels talked about as well. Um, and they also go into the tribal structure of the Iroquois studied by the anthropologist Louis, Louis Morgan in the 1880s and ancient society being looked at as matrilineal that was replicated all over the world. And um, there's a chapter on the original black mother images of the horned goddess from 7,000 to 6,000 BC when the Sahara was rich and fertile. And this image was found in caves and later became Isis. But the original black mother that spread out everywhere when the Sahara was dried up was bisexual and was the instrument of her own fertility. And so it represented the, this time in evolution that I discussed in the beginning. Um, Mawa Lisa is also discussed, the creator deity of the, of the Dehomi, who is both male and female and self-fertilizing. And the basic belief is that the earth is more powerful than the sky and holds life force in itself. And um, the basic belief is that sky gods are created by the earth who breathes them out and then can also breathe them back in again, which leads to male anxiety. And this is aligned with the modern Gaia concept. So, um, it's important to realize that women are seen as culture creators and they created most of the human culture like cooking and food processing and storage and ceramics and weaving and textiles and design, arts, language, scripts, glyphs, grain and animal domestication, calendars, astronomy, women have created all of this. And much of the argument is, is based on Evelyn Reed, the anthropologist, the myth of women's inferiority and women's evolution. And it was a fusion of maternity and labor that gave rise to the first human social systems. And when I was trying to teach us in a university context on um, the idea that women were reproducers and that women had labia and that women had clitoris and wombs, you know, was kind of rejected by some of the students who thought it was essentialist. Um, so it's important to read this book in a, in, a, in a good context. So I hope you all find a good radical feminist study group to read it in. Um, 
And uh, with that, we'll go over for parts two and three to, um, to Ray. Thank you. Um, I just uh, say that um, I knew Monica. I was a feminist artist in the West Country. And I, I, spent, I spent lots of overlapping time with her, particularly at Greenham. Um, and uh, there were regular gatherings of women at Avebury and Silbury. We used to have ritual at the top of Sil Silbury Hill. And we walked one one time we walked for two days across the firing range um, and walked from Silbury to Stonehenge. You'll see, I'm mentioning this because you'll see Silbury and Avebury repeatedly in some of the pictures that I've picked. Um, just to summarize what Batia has just uh, told us, um, this is this is a part of um, the part two that I'm covering, which is um, the organic religion of early women. The further back one goes into ancient cultures, the more the holy enters nearly every phase and activity of life. Being, being born, giving birth, making pots, digging food, planting seed, making tools, hunting, building a fire, all our acts of major aspects, all, all our acts whose major aspects fall within the sacred sphere. Social groups have magico-religious foundations. Rites of transition from one life stage to another required group participation in ritualized expression, all designed to keep the individual psyche united and in balance while passing through crises. Death was one of those major life events requiring ritual participation by the group aimed at reharmonizing the survivors as well as easing the pas passage of death. Women's religious rights were inseparable from art, magic, social and economic realities. The collectives organized their power into religious and social ec economy through the medium of art. Art was the tool of the connections, the manifest vision, expressing experience of a single life-giving principle conserved in the challenges of a world of changeless other world of the deep caves. The caves were where the Paleolithic people lived and um, they, their art was very um, symbolic. It was abstract and symbolic, um, but the, it was women's cultures that um, crafts like potters, spinners and weavers um, were, came out of women and they were, trying to express the interconnection of the, of the web of life. Uh, spider, the spider web is something that um, second wave feminists actually adopted quite a lot. So she was looking for connections, um, elemental connections. So the upper waters, the rain, um, connecting with the lower waters, the springs and the brooks, the connections of the elements, the body of the earth is the body of woman and the religious rites were combined with the craft industry. Some of the abstract symbols that you'll see repeatedly are um, the chevron, the concentric circle, and the double spiral. These were carved into stone, um, and this was predating any images of humans. The, um, the two halves of the cosmic egg were the world egg, and they um, reflected as above, so below. There was a dance of the polarities of life, death, life. And, uh, and she su suggests that these were understood from close, close prolonged experience and knowledge of natural processes. All religion is about the creation, the mystery of creation. Primeval woman was not aware of the role the male part had in the process of birth. From 2000 BC, Paleolithic, Paleolithic figurines of woman as pregnant goddess um, up to 5000 BC were found. Um, the cave, the womb of the earth, the pregnant goddess was the repository of mystic influences. Uh, the labyrinths were at the cave entrance and had to be walked or danced to connect and enter the womb cave. The spiral dance is a pathway between the two worlds, a symbolic death reborn into her to a higher psychic level, connecting with the dead 
who wait who await rebirth there was a cult of the dead human ideas of death and resurrection go back a long way part two ends with um the talking about the dance the ritual in caves and animism women with upraised arms um, are found in figurines and they are often uh, found in her paintings there's so much i'm going to carry on now with part three briefly women's culture and religion in neolithic times this is a bigger section in the book so she's as batty said women first started to settle in um, villages and there was ancient cultures there were three centers of ancient culture in the near east zagros mountains mesopotamia south anatolia Palestine and Jericho. The first layers of the city um, were eight to 7,000 BC and there were 12 layers. They buried their death in deep pits under their houses. They'd stopped burying them in caves. Cities were built by springs and wells. Well, of course they were because everyone needs water. Water is life. Um, and then the Neolithic cultures also were developed. This is the proposal in the book at the time, South East and Central Europe. And there was trading between these um, Neolithic cultures. Um, Euro, European matriarchal Neolithic culture was destroyed by invaders. There's lots of different theories about this. One of the, one of the things that struck me about the book actually slightly differently from Batia was Actually, there were not that many research references and books. The book list seems to me to be very small. 1981, it was published, and they didn't have the amount of carbon dating archaeology evidence that we've got now. So one of the things that Monica did on the seat of her pants, really, because the, the, she just sold posters to, to make a living. She had three kids, two different fathers, um, and... Um, she went to visit these places. She stayed, she st spent time with them. She'd circled these places with women and felt their energy. Um, and so this is this is very much what affirms her writing and, and her visual work. So the tomb was the earth mound, the cosmic womb of the pregnant goddess. This section goes into details of the examples of legends, myths, and ancient sites in Britain, Ireland, Scandinavia, Malta and Gozo, Many of these places she'd visited. She muses on the moon, May and myth, Kali and the megalithic yard, connecting and considering the interconnectedness of the web of life. I find that concept of interconnectedness much more, it resonates with me much more than intersectional. Sectioning things up is not the same as connecting them in the web of life. Um, she looks at our blood rites and how our menstrual cycle became a hidden dirty secret, shaming our power. And she urges us to, to reclaim period power. She defines menstrual fetish. Her writings fly through time and space. She looks at lesbian sexual autonomy, menopause, witches, IUDs. There's there's really a, a, a lot more to go into. Um, I'm probably not going to say any more because I'd like Batia to go on to part four. How are we doing? Okay, good job. <laughs> um, in my version, at least there was a 20 page bibliography. And so maybe we're looking at different versions. But um, in part four, of course, what happens is the patriarchal civilization comes along and blames everything on the mother and separates the spirit from matter and makes the mind separated from Maya, illusion, matter, dark forces, anything that God doesn't understand becomes negative and recedes um, and becomes evil like Satan, dark stuff, the dark side, the other projected onto the craziness of femaleness. Materialism becomes manly and then the ephemeral becomes female. And materialism, I thought this was a very interesting radical feminist perspective, was that materialism stresses how man conquers matter. And because um, women were working with matter all the time, but it wasn't called materialism until men conquered matter. And then that was a different relationship to matter. Um, and they were realizing the goal of escaping the world side of matter and getting to the other side and really 
conquering the dark mother. And they were concentrating on escaping to get to God and Father in the sky. So dualism became kind of a spectator sport created by men who, who were spectators at birth and priests became spectators. And there were there was a choking of the deep roots of the earth. And if you don't have the roots in the earth, then everything becomes very um, cerebral and asexual and even anti-sexual. And now the anti-God is what's worshiped. And the ever-renewing moon goddess that um, we were talking about earlier becomes the unifying psyche, which releases um, death and life together. But by contrast, um, the patriarchal religion conceived of father, uh, the male God for th three to 4,000 BC. So they had to deny evolution because to believe in evolution, you had to admit that matriarchy came first. So that's why all the fundamentalist Christians are against evolution. I thought that was a very interesting insight that they had. Um, and uh, the, all the, they talk about cosmology, the, the um, the myths of many cultures from around the world. And there was always this point at which the, um, the energy exchange from all life forms continually evolving was evolving the deities as well. Um, but there was this point where um, everything got gathered through the father and through urban temples and the gods of the upper urban classes became the invading colonizers. The peasants kept this matriarchal consciousness and knowledge of the great cosmic mother, <laughs> even through the 17th century in Europe. And um, I, an interesting discovery that Eisler also talks about is that it wasn't the discovery of metal per se. It was because metal was used in pottery and jewelry and, and male figures usually weren't found in the Neolithic artifacts, um, except in teeny little relationship to gods. It, the smelting and the mining discovered by the Aryan uh, Hittites, they, they were more efficient in their ability to wield uh, iron into objects. And so they, their secret made their weaponry stronger and they began to build chariots. And I never thought about this before I listened to this book again, was that chariots emerge once metal was conquered and used for male purposes. And once you had metal weapons and chariots, um, um, that developed from the Anatolian Hittites. This led to can conquering the matriarch everywhere around the world because chariots could go out and war could travel. And so the matriarchal cultures were overthrown. Um, so hunting had given men a bound, bonded group. And when agriculture made hunting obsolete, this large population of males was around and they had unskilled labor they didn't know what to do with themselves. They were falling trees, but then they slowly took over and created warfare. And so I think I said before that this was the one, one creation of males that we have on the planet is war. Um, and what they also did was industrialize women's crafts that we both talked about women actually created. But men didn't have to start anything from scratch the way women did. Men objectified secularized production and worked on making things um, in greater number over the quality. And many of the inventions by women uh, were taken over by men. And um, then men declared women unfit for culture. So um, you can see this in the mythology. Like for example, all of a sudden Inanna had nothing to do. And um, NK started using semen to create um, uh, offspring to fertilize himself. So all of a sudden you don't need goddesses anymore. And then goddesses are reduced to just eroticization once the celebratory culture that linked the life-giving force um, with the great cosmic mother was reduced to just eroticization. Um, then that led to pornography and all the things that we fight against today. So I think it's, it's very deep radical feminist analysis to, to look at the world this way. Um, and the, the non-working elite men became lawyers and priests and they developed the patriarchal control of women by their institutions. And women's life-giving force was controlled in patriarchal, patri-local units. So instead of collectively coming together to create, um, they were broken up and isolated. And women were never really allowed freedom except to pass on the sex serfdom to their daughters. So the goddess had been all powerful, but gave birth to the boys 
didn't wish to denigrate the men or their own offspring. And the supreme creator, the God, turned around and denigrated them anyway. So now we're going to see some wonderful pictures um, that um, Ray has gathered for us um, by Monica Saju and some of her posters. Thanks, Batia. Um, yeah, I just have to get the share screen thing going and the uh, the file. And my, my internet connection is often a little bit dodgy. So sometimes it it, it, it comes and goes, but that that uh, what she's just said about pornography. This is a really interesting example. This this is a photograph from of of her studio in Sweden. She's got her first child, a little boy, under here, and it was in an art magazine called. You have to share uh, your not... screen. You have to share your screen. Oh, oh God. Ah, oh. oh. It's the green Steph. button. Oh, yeah, you've got it. Great, well done. Oh, there we are, yeah. I don't have to do this very often. Uh, okay, let's get the right file up. I'm going to try not to panic. You're doing fine. Where? Where, where is it? What do I want to share? Oh God, I've got too many things to share. Here we are. So this was the original cover. Is that what you're showing us now? There's, yeah, the, there's uh, the, the, a lot of the, a lot of the pictures that I want to show you are actually of the era of the book. Uh, but right, here we are. It did come up and then it disappeared. This, yeah, this is from the, Arts, Arts Magazine, 1996, and um, they had airbrush. In her early work, she did quite a lot of pictures with the, the penis in, and this penises in these paintings were airbrushed out in this uh, art magazine as as pornographic. But actually, the fact that they were um, erased in the magazine gave her a reputation of that her work was pornographic, which is just linked so much with what. Um, with what um, uh, Monica, uh, Patty has just described. This is um, 1968. This is the painting that made her famous stroke infamous. I and... think you need to click on the, on the art that you're describing. We're still looking at the book cover. Oh, oh, are you? Yeah. So you need to show us that picture of Monica on the art journal? A thing you can do, Jill, is stop sharing. So click. That okay, button, stop sharing. And then start sharing again. That often does it. That's an easy way to okay. solve it. It could work now. Right, let's try again then. Can we all see that now? Uh, it's hard to get the feedback. Yeah, okay. Now we can see all the pictures. Now you need to click on the individual pictures you want to show us. Oh, I've got the individual pictures showing. We just see a whole group of them. Okay. We can, can actually, see we could see them. They're quite small, but we could see them. So in a way, if you just talk about, or try and click on, tell us, tell are you, going to talk about this forest beings one or tell us the name uh, of uh, okay okay um oh god i've you see I, i've not done this with a, a screen share before okay i'll i can can't even zoom in um i'm gonna give it one more go the other Is thing Jill, up now Jill, sing... if you can see it then hey? stop, sh stop sharing and then start yeah. sharing again. And we'll probably be able to see what you can see. So keep going back like that. It's There's a reasonably good chance we'll be able to see it big now. You see it big? It's taking a while to come up. No, we could just see this tiles of lots and lots of pictures at the moment. Ah, uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm really not very good at all this and I, 
I wanted to do a chronological order, but a bit. Oh, I'll, um, I'm going to have to start again. <coughs> so, the, so, oh, how no, I can't even scroll in. Uh, anyway, I've, I've told you about the picture of the Swedish um, art magazine. You send the five um, God giving birth. Which I, pardon? Someone suggested you send the file to the host and let her click on stuff. If um, you send the file to, to Joe. Possibly, but God knows how I even do that. Um, I, I, I'm really, okay. I, I, it would have been better if I'd done this earlier. Um, uh, I don't know what to do. I mean, it's just Jill. Jill, I recommend you just Jill. Listen, just tell us the story. Don't worry about this tech thing. It's a shame we can't see them, but just it's great listening to you and Batcher tell the stories. Just okay. talk it through. We don't need to see these. It's a shame, but just just tell us what you were saying because it's amazing. Okay. Well, God giving birth made her infamous. Um, well, I, I mean, can you see all the little thumbnails at the moment? Yeah, we can see it and we can see you clicking, showing. So it's fine. We can see it. It's small, but we can see it. Oh, so this 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 picture is um, 1978. It's a photograph of Monica in front of her painting, God uh, giving birth. God just giving uh, Avery. And um, I put it in because all her work was absolutely massive and she lived in squats and tiny flats and borrowed studios. But you can see her with her hands held up, which is one of these poses that were in the figurines. And it's there to give you an idea of the scale of her work. And I've got another one here, this one, um, which again gives the scale of her, of her work. Oh, I'm so used to clicking you to see, you can't see them. Um, this is an early one, Sisterhood is Powerful. This uh, is the Sphinx, Women's Liberation. And this is also known as Women of the Real Left. And this, this is um, 1968, it was a poster. Since I consider that the only true revolution will come about with this, when the silent mass of women finally rise, I will not join a left-wing group but work with women in the women's liberation movement. That was um, a statement that she made in 1971. And that, um, that was from um, a, 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 state, a statement of feminist art that she wrote with some other women. Um, got um, up here is another early one, women are seeking freedom from oppression. Sisterhood is powerful. 1972 and this is early posters it's a shame you can't see these these this she did a lot of screen printing and as and I said she, she earned a lot of her, her income was just from selling screen prints and posters um so I mean you I think we've all got one in the corner here there's one that's very famous called the lovers and loads of us have that one um, Monica was actually bisexual originally. I think that she became more and more lesbian as she as she went through her life. Um, this is um, 1974. This one is um, Women Make Music. That's from the book, so it's a black and white uh, cop uh, copy. Um, this is Women's Work and Crafts. This is from the exhibition in London, so it's in full colour. You can it see. looks very socialist realist if you look at it when it's enlarged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. those heroes from the 1930s. Um, okay, this, this one is really lovely. Karnak, 1980. Uh, it's got this lines of the, the, uh, the landscape. Karnak is an area in Brittany um, uh, which has got a huge amount of um, Neolithic stones, circles, passages um, of um, 
Celtic, that, so they were very similar to what we find in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, uh, Cornwall, um, and it's in Britain is in, in France, so the Celtic, Northwest Celtic part of France. Um, down here, we've got You Can't Kill the Spirit. This was a poster, and this was a song that we sang at Greenham a lot. We've got We've got the earth womb tomb in here. We've actually got a little tiny um, fetus. Uh, um, and at the top of that mound, there's a woman holding her hands up to the sky as above, so below with the uh, circling of women holding hands around the bottom of the, this is the hill that we used to go and do a lot of ritual at the top of. And I popped this in because it's so resonant with um, the New Year's Eve uh, in, in action that we did at Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp. New Year's Eve was picked because we knew that they'd all be having a party and we were able to get into the into the highly um, private area where they were building the silos for cruise missiles, nuclear cruise missiles to come. I was, um, I was at that action, I was lying in a ditch with the um, ladders because we didn't use net, uh, bolt cutters at that time. Um, Next, got Monica at the San Francisco um, Dyke March, and she was there in 1996. Um, it's got pictures on this poster, this banner she's holding up. She's got pictures of the beginning of the end of patriarchy. It was just after she'd been and done um, a big action in the cathedral, this one here. Um, a group of women in Bristol were doing actions around, around the Bristol and Greenham area. And they um, they went in they they intervened in a huge um, ceremony in the Bristol Cathedral. She was holding her poster, God giving birth. They sang the burning times. They denounced the Christian Church as uh, committing crimes against humanity, and then they turned around and walked out. And um, so this was. A sort of wave of, of the beginning of the end of patriarchy, 1993. Um, and I think it was like we were starting to approach the, the turn of the millennium. And so it was slightly, uh, I think there was a lot of, there was a lot of concern and, and actual fear mongering around the, the, um, the turn of the millennium. Um, you know, somebody just put in the chat the link to her art sites. Do you want to look at that and talk about that art? So that people oh. can see the art. Oh, I could give it a try. Oh, any better? Can you see that? Jill, do the same thing of uh, stop sharing and then start sharing again, because it takes somehow you have to reload it. OK. Has it come up? No, sorry, I distracted you. It, oh. takes, it takes a second to come up. Yeah, it's come up now. Yeah, yeah. This oh. Okay, yeah. so it's the slow time. What thing? Well, you can see here the picture of the beginning of the end of patriarchy and the direct action that they did in Bristol Cathedral. That's this one on the right here. Um, Again, like we've got a picture of Monica here, this gives a good um, idea of the scale of her work. Um, this this earth pot thing, she was um, very, in, that's re representing the potters. Um, this is, uh, the earth is our mother. The, the, these stones, the, the menhirs, uh, she puts them in quite a lot. Uh, and uh, what have we got here? This. I'm not familiar with that painting. Yeah, there's that one of her in front again with the scale. This is this is Mother Earth in Pain, um, 1996, and this is um, oh god, you see they haven't put the they, they, they put this in, but this is this is um, Karnak. This is Karnak. This the Stone Passage and Avenue. Um, these zigzags, the chevrons, uh, you can you can read so much into these, especially if you get a closer look. Um, yeah. Let me just 
illustrate them. Well, you've turned everyone on to a good resource, so. Yeah, um, basically the, um, the story of the exhibition that happened in London was that Monica had three sons. One of them died of cancer, one of them died in France in a road accident, and one of them survived and moved to Portugal. And after Monica's death, um, he was a somewhat lost character apparently in Portugal. And there was, he had a loads of Monica's paintings. They weren't being stored very well. And there was a forest fire where he was living and the flames were approaching the house and the wind changed direction and the paintings were saved. And at that point, Anne Johnson, who um, was Monica's um, daughter-in-law and the mother of the son in Portugal, went to Portugal and salvaged the paintings, uh, got them back to England. And um, it, it's an absolute miracle that they were, they were salvaged. And really, she didn't sell that many paintings. And there were small exhibitions. But um, this is why I think it was such a groundbreaking exhibition in London. And they are wanting to um, promote her work. There is a sort of rebirth, I think, and a re reinterest um, in Monica's essentialist work. So um, they're going to be at Philia, Monica and Maggie Parks, who is also a Greenham woman, um, they're going to be at Philia talking about Monica, they're part of the, this curate, curatorial collective. Um, and um, yeah, Morven and I went to some talks uh, and spent quite a lot of time this exhibition. I think it's a bit frustrating that we can't do the justice to the images. So maybe we should just go on to the Q&A and I'll stop sharing. Yeah, does anyone have any questions they want to put in the chat? Oh, I will say that we're both going to go to the breakout room as well afterwards. So, um, oh, there are some, what's in the chat here? Right, Another check. link was put in the chat. Okay. Oh yeah, the chat has, they got the link for the breakout rooms. Oh. Oh, has has the um? Oh no, I can't see the link to the breakout rooms yet. Oh gosh, there's so much more to say. Oh, you're gonna just just do a little bit more reading. You want to read more from her book? Mm, I could, I, no, no. There's some of uh, some of her posters and book and magazine covers. Her, her, her activism was so much part of her her work. She 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 travelled. Um, she went to conferences. Um, it's probably going to be as easy. Yeah. What did she say? This is a picture of me and Monica at Greenham. I didn't put that in the slideshow, but I I'm, um I was quite shocked. They haven't named me, but they've named Monica. When she wrote that um, Towards a Feminist Revolutionary Art, did you read that pamphlet or was that just a poster? I, ha I haven't read the pamphlet. I, I haven't read the pamphlet. This, this is the image of her posters, some of her posters. You can see them a little bit closer there. The Lovers is in the bottom corner. There's the, there's the picture of Monica um, Pentra Ivan, uh, triple goddess, Dom Krom Kromlek, and then the painting a year later from that photograph. So you can see, although they look really imaginative, they're actually really accurate. Well, that one is. There's another one here of the bleeding you. The, the Bleeding You is um, a druidic uh, tree, a yew tree, right near St. Non's Well, in uh, the west, west, southwest tip of Wales, where she lived for quite a while. Um, oh, here's a bit more of a close up of St. Non's Well. We've got the um, 
green man in the corner there, another menhir with a vision and the triscal uh, spirals. The triscal is a very uh, Celtic. Would you say that her art was erotic? No. No, no, it was more, it was more um, cosmic and energizing mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a more, it's the interconnectedness really. Um, where we've got, you can't kill the spirit, the silvery mound with the womb tomb, with the, Oh, here's an early one of an example of how she was portraying masculine, um, a masculine war m thing um, with the, uh, this is a, a very early one. She stopped doing those. She seems to stop doing them. Again, so, a bit of an idea of the scale. Someone's pointing out their slideshows and videos on YouTube, if anyone wants to pursue this further. The images. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this, the this, book is available. You can get it on Amazon. This is this is the uh, the later one, nineteen ninety six, Mother Earth in Pain. Oh, I'm so sorry that the slide thing hasn't worked. This is the West Kennet Long Barrow, where a lot of us spent um, the night. It's it is actually not that far from Greenham. And this um, passage grave um, was part of, uh, what was this with Jean's uh, message? Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm not really a, a writer, <laughs> I'm an artist, but we've got like here, this is, this is, I think this is how she envisaged, this was how people were buried in the fetal position at that time. We've got the lines, the energy lines. Uh, her work massively influenced my work. I was being um, a, a weaver, designer hand weaver at the time. And uh, I'm very, weaving's quite restricted. I wasn't doing tapestry. So I really liked the way uh, I was learning yoga. We were looking at chakras, the colors, the colors and the connections and representations of, of colors as well. Do you want to summarize anything, Batty? Have you got a bit more? Well, I just want to say she influenced me as an artist as well, because I've been working with um, ancient archaeological images of goddesses for years, inspiring my own art. So it's not like I looked at her art and did what she did, but I went back to the sources the way she did. And that's been the source of my art um, for, for many, many years. And I still teach that way to like, give people images of goddesses and have them paint to connect to the goddess. Um, I just also want to say that as a mythologist, I thought she did an incredible job showing the similarities in the world mythology about how at a certain point, um, the males started putting down women's religion. It didn't go down naturally. It went down with a hammer and a nail. <laughs> um, like um, when Anke started to fertilize himself with his own semen. He also went to Anana and told her that, you know, basically she could spin now, you know? So yeah, that's a nice thing that women goddesses do is spin thread, but, but he told her that's all she could do. Um, so, so these shifts didn't happen. They, they needed mythological stories to ensure that the women's religion went down. That's something I got from part four. And someone mentioned in the chat that it was terrible to read part four because it was horrible to see the rise of patriarchy. But I thought that she or both of them did a very good job showing the mechanisms by which the mythology ensured that the um, old religion went down. It's not just that it got outdated. <laughs> mm. Mm. Okay, I think we're well. We had we had thought about reading the charge of the goddess to end with, Matthew. Have you got? Oh, do you have it? Oh, I've got it upstairs. Um, oh, here we are. We weren't really expecting to have enough time. Listen to the words of Great Mother. She says, 
whenever ye have need of anything once in the month and better it be when the moon is full then ye shall ye be assemble in some secret place to these i will teach things that are yet unknown and ye shall be free from all slavery keep pure your highest ideals strive ever toward it let naught stop you nor turn you aside mine is the cup of the wine of life and the cauldron of keridwen i am the mother of all living and my love is poured out upon the earth i am the beauty of the green earth and the white moon among the stars and the mystery of the waters and the desire in the heart of woman it's beautiful before, before my eyes let thine innermost self be unfolded in the raptures of the infinite know the mystery that if that which thou seekest thou findest not within me thou will never find it without thee for behold i have been with thee from the beginning and i await thee now blessed be thanks okay i'm going to pop over to the breakout room i think i just click on this link here no yeah no uh, it's in the chat. Okay. So I'm just I'm just going to this is Joe here. I'm just going to uh, jump in and say hello. Say thank you so much uh, for that. Um, it was completely brilliant. Um, it's so interesting. And and uh, as other people have said, we can look at the images. We can all go and look at the images online. Um, mm -hmm. And then we we really hope. I mean, I think women have loved this. That you two will come back and tell us more about art um, and some radical feminist art in the future, perhaps next year. So, and then uh, wonderfully, you're going to be in the breakout room. So thank you very much, Jill and Batcha. Oh, thank, thank you, you Joe. See, see you everybody. at Philia. <laughs> yeah, see, I'll see you at Philia and see everybody next week, uh, one way or another. Okay, bye everybody.